Book Seven, Chapter One of Progress and Poverty by Henry George. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Seven, Justice of the Remedy. Justice is a relation of congruity which really subsists between two things. This relation is always the same, whatever being considers it, whether it be God or an angel or lastly a man. Montesquieu. Book Seven, Chapter One, The Injustice of Private Property in Land. When it is proposed to abolish private property in land, the first question that will arise is that of justice. Though often warped by habit, superstition, and selfishness into the most distorted forms, the sentiment of justice is yet fundamental to the human mind, and whatever dispute arouses the passions of men, the conflict is sure to rage, not so much as to the question, is it wise, as to the question, is it right? This tendency of popular discussions to take an ethical form has a cause. It springs from a law of the human mind. It rests upon a vague and instinctive recognition of what is probably the deepest truth we can grasp. That alone is wise which is just. That alone is enduring which is right. In the narrow scale of individual actions and individual life, this truth may be often obscured, but in the wider field of national life it everywhere stands out. I bow to this arbitrament and accept this test. If our inquiry into the cause which makes low wages and pauperism the accompaniments of material progress has led us to a correct conclusion, it will bear translation from terms of political economy into terms of ethics, and as the source of social evils show a wrong. If it will not do this, it is disproved. If it will do this, it is proved by the final decision. If private property in land be just, then is the remedy I propose a false one. If, on the contrary, private property in land be unjust, then is this remedy the true one. What constitutes the rightful basis of property? What is it that enables a man justly to say of a thing, it is mine? From what springs the sentiment which acknowledges his exclusive right as against all the world? Is it not primarily the right of a man to himself, to the use of his own powers, to the enjoyment of the fruits of his own exertions? Is it not this individual right which springs from and is testified to by the natural facts of individual organization, the fact that each particular pair of hands obey a particular brain and are related to a particular stomach? The fact that each man is a definite, coherent, independent whole, which alone justifies individual ownership? As a man belongs to himself, so his labor when put in concrete form belongs to him. And for this reason, that which a man makes or produces is his own, as against all the world, to enjoy or to destroy, to use, to exchange or to give. No one else can rightfully claim it, and his exclusive right to it involves no wrong to anyone else. Thus there is to everything produced by human exertion a clear and indisputable title to exclusive possession and enjoyment, which is perfectly consistent with justice, as it descends from the original producer, in whom it vested by natural law. The pen with which I am writing is justly mine. No other human being can rightfully lay claim to it, for in me is the title of the producers who made it. It has become mine, because transferred to me by the stationer, to whom it was transferred by the importer, who obtained the exclusive right to it by transfer from the manufacturer, in whom, by the same process of purchase, vested the rights of those who dug the material from the ground and shaped it into a pen. Thus my exclusive right of ownership in the pen springs from the natural right of the individual to the use of his own faculties. Now, this is not only the original source from which all ideas of exclusive ownership arise, as is evident from the natural tendency of the mind to revert to it when the idea of exclusive ownership is questioned, and the manner in which social relations develop, but it is necessarily the only source. 
There can be to the ownership of anything no rightful title which is not derived from the title of the producer and does not rest upon the natural right of the man to himself. There can be no other rightful title, because, first, there is no other natural right from which any other title can be derived, and, second, because the recognition of any other title is inconsistent with and destructive of this. For, first, what other right exists from which the right to the exclusive possession of anything can be derived, save the right of a man to himself? With what other power is man by nature clothed, save the power of exerting his own faculties? How can he in any other way act upon or affect material things or other men? Paralyze the motor nerves, and your man has no more external influence or power than a log or stone. From what else, then, can the right of possessing and controlling things be derived? If it spring not from man himself, from what can it spring? Nature acknowledges no ownership or control in man save as the result of exertion. In no other way can her treasures be drawn forth, her powers directed, or her forces utilized or controlled. She makes no discriminations among men, but is to all absolutely impartial. She knows no distinction between master and slave, king and subject, saint and sinner. All men to her stand upon an equal footing and have equal rights. She recognizes no claim but that of labor, and recognizes that without respect to the claimant. If a pirate spread his sails, the wind will fill them as well as it will fill those of a peaceful merchantman or missionary bark. If a king and a common man be thrown overboard, neither can keep his head above water except by swimming. Birds will not come to be shot by the proprietor of the soil any quicker than they will come to be shot by the poacher. A fish will bite or will not bite at a hook, in utter disregard as to whether it is offered them by a good little boy who goes to Sunday school, or a bad little boy who plays truant. Grain will grow only as the ground is prepared and the seed is sown. It is only at the call of labor that ore can be raised from the mine. The sun shines and the rain falls, alike upon just and unjust. The laws of nature are the decrees of the Creator. There is written in them no recognition of any right save that of labor, and in them is written broadly and clearly the equal right of all men to the use and enjoyment of nature, to apply to her by their exertions, and to receive and possess her reward. Hence, as nature gives only to labor, the exertion of labor in production is the only title to exclusive possession. Second, this right of ownership that springs from labor excludes the possibility of any other right of ownership. If a man be rightfully entitled to the produce of his labor, then no one can be rightfully entitled to the ownership of anything which is not the produce of his labor, or the labor of someone else from whom the right has passed to him. If production give to the producer the right to exclusive possession and enjoyment, there can rightfully be no exclusive possession and enjoyment of anything not the production of labor, and the recognition of private property in land is a wrong. For the right to the produce of labor cannot be enjoyed without the right to the free use of the opportunities offered by nature, and to admit the right of property in these is to deny the right of property in the produce of labor. When non-producers can claim as rent a portion of the wealth created by producers, the right of the producers to the fruit of their labor is to that extent denied. There is no escape from this position. To affirm that a man can rightfully claim exclusive ownership in his own labor when embodied in material things is to deny that anyone can rightfully claim exclusive ownership in land. To affirm the rightfulness of property in land is to affirm a claim which has no warrant in nature, as against a claim founded in the organization of man and the laws of the material universe. What most prevents the realization of the injustice of private property in land is the habit of including all the things that are made the subject of ownership in one category as property or, if any distinction is made, drawing the line, according to the unphilosophical distinction of the lawyers, between personal property and real estate, or things movable and things immovable. The real and natural distinction is between things which are the produce of labor and things which are the gratuitous offerings of nature, 
or to adopt the terms of political economy between wealth and land. These two classes of things are in essence and relations widely different, and to class them together as property is to confuse all thought when we come to consider the justice or the injustice, the right or the wrong of property. A house and the lot on which it stands are alike property, as being the subject of ownership, and are alike classed by the lawyers as real estate. Yet in nature and relations they differ widely. The one is produced by human labor, and belongs to the class in political economy styled wealth. The other is a part of nature, and belongs to the class in political economy styled land. The essential character of the one class of things is that they embody labor, are brought into being by human exertion, their existence or non-existence, their increase or diminution, depending on man. The essential character of the other class of things is that they do not embody labor, and exist irrespective of human exertion and irrespective of man. They are the field or environment in which man finds himself, the storehouse from which his needs must be supplied the raw material upon which and the forces with which alone his labor can act. The moment this distinction is realized, that moment is it seen that the sanction which natural justice gives to one species of property is denied to the other, that the rightfulness which attaches to individual property in the produce of labor implies the wrongfulness of individual property in land, that, whereas the recognition of the one places all men upon equal terms, securing to each the due reward of his labor, the recognition of the other is the denial of the equal rights of men, permitting those who do not labor to take the natural reward of those who do. Whatever may be said for the institution of private property in land, it is therefore plain that it cannot be defended on the score of justice. The equal right of all men to the use of land is as clear as their equal right to breathe the air. It is a right proclaimed by the fact of their existence. For we cannot suppose that some men have a right to be in this world, and others no right. If we are all here by the equal permission of the Creator, we are all here with an equal title to the enjoyment of His bounty, with an equal right to the use of all that nature so impartially offers. Footnote. In saying that private property in land can, in the ultimate analysis, be justified only on the theory that some men have a better right to existence than others, I am stating only what the advocates of the existing system have themselves perceived. What gave to Malthus his popularity among the ruling classes, what caused his illogical book to be received as a new revelation, induced sovereigns to send him decorations, and the meanest rich man in England to propose to give him a living, was the fact that he furnished a plausible reason for the assumption that some have a better right to existence than others, an assumption which is necessary for the justification of private property in land, and which Malthus clearly states in the declaration that the tendency of population is constantly to bring into the world human beings for whom nature refuses to provide, and who consequently have not the slightest right to any share in the existing store of the necessaries of life, whom she tells as interlopers to be gone, and does not hesitate to extort by force obedience to her mandates, employing for that purpose hunger and pestilence, war and crime, mortality and neglect of infantine life, prostitution and syphilis. And today this Malthusian doctrine is the ultimate defense upon which those who justify private property in land fall back. In no other way can it be logically defended. End of footnote. This is a right which is natural and inalienable. It is a right which vests in every human being as he enters the world, and which, during his continuance in the world, can be limited only by the equal rights of others. There is in nature no such thing as a fee simple in land. There is on earth no power which can rightfully make a grant of exclusive ownership in land. If all existing men were to unite to grant away their equal rights, they could not grant away the right of those who follow them. For what are we but tenants for a day? Have we made the earth that we should determine the rights of those who after us shall tenant it in their turn? 
The Almighty, who created the earth for man and man for the earth, has entailed it upon all the generations of the children of men by a decree written upon the constitution of all things, a decree which no human action can bar and no prescription determine. Let the parchments be ever so many, or possession ever so long, natural justice can recognize no right in one man to the possession and enjoyment of land that is not equally the right of all his fellows. Though his titles have been acquiesced in by generation after generation, to the landed estates of the Duke of Westminster the poorest child that is born in London today has as much right as has his eldest son. Footnote this natural and inalienable right to the equal use and enjoyment of land is so apparent that it has been recognized by men wherever force or habit has not blunted first perceptions. To give but one instance, the white settlers of New Zealand found themselves unable to get from the Maoris what the latter considered a complete title to land because, although a whole tribe might have consented to a sale, they would still claim with every new child born among them an additional payment on the ground that they had parted with only their own rights and could not sell those of the unborn. The government was obliged to step in and settle the matter by buying land for a tribal annuity in which every child that is born acquires a share. End of footnote. Though the sovereign people of the state of New York consent to the landed possessions of the Astors, the puniest infant that comes wailing into the world in the squalidest room of the most miserable tenement house becomes at that moment seized of an equal right with the millionaires, and it is robbed if the right is denied. Our previous conclusions, irresistible in themselves, thus stand approved by the highest and final test. Translated from terms of political economy into terms of ethics, they show a wrong as the source of the evils which increase as material progress goes on. The masses of men, who in the midst of abundance suffer want, who, clothed with political freedom, are condemned to the wages of slavery, to whose toil labor-saving inventions bring no relief, but rather seem to rob them of a privilege, instinctively feel that there is something wrong, and they are right. The wide-spreading social evils which everywhere oppress men amid an advancing civilization spring from a great primary wrong, the appropriation as the exclusive property of some men of the land on which and from which all must live. From this fundamental injustice flow all the injustices which distort and endanger modern development, which condemn the producer of wealth to poverty and pamper the non-producer in luxury, which rear the tenement house with the palace plant the brothel behind the church, and compel us to build prisons as we open new schools. There is nothing strange or inexplicable in the phenomena that are now perplexing the world. It is not that material progress is not in itself a good. It is not that nature has called into being children for whom she has failed to provide. It is not that the Creator has left on natural laws a taint of injustice at which even the human mind revolts, that material progress brings such bitter fruits. That amid our highest civilization men faint and die with want is not due to the niggardliness of nature, but to the injustice of man. Vice and misery, poverty and pauperism, are not the legitimate results of increase of population and industrial development. They only follow increase of population and industrial development because land is treated as private property. They are the direct and necessary results of the violation of the supreme law of justice, involved in giving to some men the exclusive possession of that which nature provides for all men. The recognition of individual proprietorship of land is the denial of the natural rights of other individuals. It is a wrong which must show itself in the inequitable division of wealth. For as labor cannot produce without the use of land, the denial of the equal right to the use of land is necessarily the denial of the right of labor to its own produce. If one man can command the land upon which others must labor, he can appropriate the produce of their labor as the price of his permission to labor. The fundamental law of nature, that her enjoyment by man shall be consequent upon his exertion, is thus violated. The one receives without producing the others produce without receiving. The one is unjustly enriched, the others are robbed. 
To this fundamental wrong we have traced the unjust distribution of wealth which is separating modern society into the very rich and the very poor. It is the continuous increase of rent, the price that labor is compelled to pay for the use of land, which strips the many of the wealth they justly earn, to pile it up in the hands of the few who do nothing to earn it. Why should they who suffer from this injustice hesitate for one moment to sweep it away? Who are the landholders that they should thus be permitted to reap where they have not sown? Consider for a moment the utter absurdity of the titles by which we permit to be gravely passed from John Doe to Richard Rowe the right exclusively to possess the earth, giving absolute dominion as against all others. In California our land titles go back to the supreme government of Mexico, who took from the Spanish king, who took from the Pope, when he by a stroke of the pen divided lands yet to be discovered between the Spanish or Portuguese, or if you please they rest upon conquest. In the eastern states they go back to treaties with Indians and grants from English kings, in Louisiana to the government of France, in Florida to the government of Spain, while in England they go back to the Norman conquerors. Everywhere, not to a right which obliges, but to a force which compels. And when a title rests but on force, no complaint can be made when force annuls it. Whenever the people, having the power, choose to annul those titles, no objection can be made in the name of justice. There have existed men who had the power to hold or to give exclusive possession of portions of the earth's surface, but when and where did there exist the human being who had the right? The right to exclusive ownership of anything of human production is clear. No matter how many the hands through which it has passed, there was, at the beginning of the line, human labor. Someone who, having procured or produced it by his exertions, had to it a clear title as against all the rest of mankind, and which could justly pass from one to another by sale or gift. But at the end of what string of conveyances or grants can be shown or supposed a like title to any part of the material universe? To improvements such an original title can be shown, but it is a title only to the improvements and not to the land itself. If I clear a forest, drain a swamp, or fill a morass, all I can justly claim is the value given by these exertions. They give me no right to the land itself, no claim other than to my equal share with every other member of the community in the value which is added to it by the growth of the community. But it will be said, there are improvements which in time become indistinguishable from the land itself. Very well then the title to the improvements becomes blended with the title to the land. The individual right is lost in the common right. It is the greater that swallows up the less, not the less that swallows up the greater. Nature does not proceed from man, but man from nature, and it is into the bosom of nature that he and all his works must return again. Yet it will be said, as every man has a right to the use and enjoyment of nature, the man who is using land must be permitted to the exclusive right to its use in order that he may get the full benefit of his labor. But there is no difficulty in determining where the individual right ends and the common right begins. A delicate and exact test is supplied by value, and with its aid there is no difficulty, no matter how dense population may become, in determining and securing the exact rights of each, the equal rights of all. The value of land, as we have seen, is the price of monopoly. It is not the absolute, but the relative capability of land that determines its value. No matter what may be its intrinsic qualities, land that is no better than other land which may be had for the using can have no value. And the value of land always measures the difference between it and the best land that may be had for the using. Thus the value of land expresses in exact and tangible form the right of the community and land held by an individual, and rent expresses the exact amount which the individual should pay to the community to satisfy the equal rights of all other members of the community. Thus, if we concede to priority of possession the undisturbed use of land, confiscating rent for the benefit of the community, we reconcile the fixity of tenure which is necessary for improvement with a full and complete recognition of the equal rights of all to the use of land. 
As for the deduction of a complete and exclusive individual right to land from priority of occupation, that is, if possible, the most absurd ground on which land ownership can be defended. Priority of occupation give exclusive and perpetual title to the surface of a globe on which, in the order of nature, countless generations succeed each other. Had the men of the last generation any better right to the use of this world than we of this, or the men of a hundred years ago? or of a thousand years ago? Had the mound builders or the cave dwellers, the contemporaries of the mastodon and the three-toed horse, or the generations still further back, who, in dim eons that we can think of only as geologic periods, followed each other on the earth we now tenant for our little day? Has the first comer at a banquet the right to turn back all the chairs and claim that none of the other guests shall partake of the food provided, except as they make terms with him? Does the first man who presents a ticket at the door of a theatre and passes in acquire by his priority the right to shut the doors and have the performance go on for him alone? Does the first passenger who enters a railroad car obtain the right to scatter his baggage over all the seats and compel the passengers who come in after him to stand up? The cases are perfectly analogous. We arrive and we depart, guests at a banquet continually spread, spectators and participants in an entertainment where there is room for all to come, passengers from station to station, on an orb that whirls through space. Our rights to take and possess cannot be exclusive. They must be bounded everywhere by the equal rights of others. Just as the passenger in a railroad car may spread himself and his baggage over as many seats as he pleases until other passengers come in, so may a settler take and use as much land as he chooses until it is needed by others, a fact which is shown by the land acquiring a value, when his right must be curtailed by the equal rights of the others, and no priority of appropriation can give a right which will bar these equal rights of others. If this were not the case, then by priority of appropriation one man could acquire and could transmit to whom he pleased not merely the exclusive right to a hundred and sixty acres, or to six hundred and forty acres, but to a whole township, a whole state, a whole continent. And to this manifest absurdity does the recognition of individual right to land come when carried to its ultimate that any one human being, could he concentrate in himself the individual rights to the land of any country, could expel therefrom all the rest of its inhabitants, and could he thus concentrate the individual rights to the whole surface of the globe, he alone of all the teeming population of the earth would have the right to live. And what upon this supposition would occur is, upon a smaller scale, realized in actual fact. The territorial lords of Great Britain, to whom grants of land have given the white parasols and elephants mad with pride, have over and over again expelled from large districts the native population, whose ancestors had lived on the land from immemorial times, driven them off to emigrate, to become paupers or to starve. And on uncultivated tracts of land in the new state of California may be seen the blackened chimneys of homes from which settlers have been driven by force of laws which ignore natural right, and great stretches of land which might be populous or desolate, because the recognition of exclusive ownership has put it in the power of one human creature to forbid his fellows from using it. The comparative handful of proprietors who own the surface of the British islands would be doing only what British law gives them full power to do, and what many of them have done on a smaller scale already, were they to exclude the millions of British people from their native islands. And such an exclusion, by which a few hundred thousand should at will banish thirty million people from their native country, while it would be more striking, would not be a whit more repugnant to natural right than the spectacle now presented of the vast body of the British people being compelled to pay such enormous sums to a few of their number for the privilege of being permitted to live upon and use the land which they so fondly call their own, which is endeared to them by memories so tender and so glorious, and for which they are held in duty bound, if need be, to spill their blood and lay down their lives. I refer only to the British islands, because, land ownership being more concentrated there, they afford a more striking illustration of what private property and land necessarily involves. To whomsoever the soil at any time belongs, to him belong the fruits of it, 
is a truth that becomes more and more apparent as population becomes denser and invention and improvement add to productive power. But it is everywhere a truth, as much in our new states as in the British islands or by the banks of the Indus. End of Book 7, Chapter 1 Recording by Tim Makarios Idiophilus.wordpress.com